teaching, I want you to turn to the book of Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles. You have two Samuels, you have two Kings, and you have two Chronicles. It's the sixth of the six. But we're not going to be in chapter six. That would be six, six, six. Yeah, we're staying away from that. Second Chronicles chapter 15. Uh, you are here, the people who are listening or watching uh, will get this. Beyond that, I have nothing to say, uh, you know, how, what happens after this. But we'll take it as it comes. Verse 1, and the Spirit of God came upon Azariah, the son of Oded. And he went out to meet Asa and said unto him, Hear ye me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin. <clears throat> the Lord is with you while ye be with him. And if ye seek him, he will be found of you. But if ye you, if you, ye forsake him, he will forsake you. Now for a long season Israel has been without the true God, and without a teaching priest, and without, the, without law. But when they in their trouble did turn unto the Lord God of Israel and sought him, he was found of them. And in those times there was no peace to him that went out, nor to him that came in, but great vexations were upon all the inhabitants of the countries. And nation was destroyed of nation, and city of city, for God did vex them with all adversity. Be strong, therefore, let not your hands be weak, for your work shall be rewarded." Okay, let's have a word of prayer and we'll get going in here. Father, thank you for the requests that were made tonight, the people that are here, the people that are watching. We thank you for the reading of your word. Uh, we do pray you'd bless it to our spiritual understanding. There are many things to uh, get out of here, many things to say. And I just ask that the Holy Spirit guide me to say the things you want said and in the way you want them said and not to hold back because of some kind of uh, indwelling fear of reprisal or uh, from someone on the outside. We are your people. We are called by your name. Uh, we, we've read of what happened after the death, burial, and resurrection and the beginning of the church and the persecutions that, that came upon them. And they set a great example for us as we may be marching toward uh, the end of an age and possibly uh, persecution as well. Uh, we don't know, but we need to be prepared. So speak to our hearts here this evening. May your will be done. And may we take away from here some things that will strengthen us and challenge us and uh, bring us closer to you. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, I'd like you to go back to 1 Kings chapter 12. 1 Kings chapter 12. I know I'm jumping into a, the middle of something. And it's always good to know a little bit about who's being spoken to, or what kind of a person that was. Um, so, First Kings chapter twelve. I don't think I've got the right the right one. It might be, huh? it might be Second Kings twelve. I'm dealing with twos. No. Anyway. Uh, the person that I'm looking to talk about is Asa. One of the things that was said about him is that he did write in the sight of the Lord according to his father David. He, uh, he removed the Sodomites from the tribe of Benjamin, the country that Benjamin frequented. Did a lot of good things. And as you went down through the list, the one thing that he never did get to complete. He couldn't remove the people from the groves. Uh, he, could, he just couldn't get rid of them. So uh, I chose this scripture. I'll find that later. It's probably in, in my margin here, and I'm, I, I don't want to take the time to read through it. So I chose this scripture tonight because of the gravity what, of what has led us 
to a nation of people, I believe, to the brink of near collapse. I don't know, that, I don't know how much more there is to hold on to. Israel went through many things which we can identify and make application in, in these days, especially in these end days. And so they found tranquility, they found peace only after departing from truth and being punished for it long enough to say, we've had enough of this, we repent. If, if God did not punish them, if he did not judge them, they would have continued to go on and on and on and on. Our nation, if, there is not, if there's not a judgment of, of significant uh, energy and value, our country will continue to go this direction that we're going. It just, it, it is what it is. And, and then when they did repent, God was merciful and gracious to them. So our nation, at one time, graciously was endued with great power, great resources, great wealth, and freedom beyond the imaginations of most of the existing world. Nobody, nobody could figure how we could do what we did and, and have the freedom. We held to God as our creator uh, of the earth, of the universe, of us. We held to the importance of spiritual education in our churches and in our schools. And we held to law and order. And now the prophet Azariah speaks to the king of Judah, which is Asa. And he says in verse two, the Lord is with you when you're with him. And if you seek him, he'll be found of you. All right, so we have a condition here. It's not, it's not an unconditional statement, it's a conditional. If you're with the Lord, the Lord's with you. If you seek the Lord when you're with him, he'll be found of you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. And then, Ezra gives us three essentials. We could say fundamentals. People get all bent out of shape when you say that, but that's what they are. To a national peace or tranquility. And here's the first one. Chapter 15 in verse uh, 3. Now without, for a long season, Israel hath been without the true God. That is essential, the true God, the, the presence and power of, of divine deity. So hold your place here, go to Proverbs, uh, Psalm chapter 18. Psalm chapter 18. It's important in our day to identify who exactly is being spoken of. We have all different kinds of religions and they all have their, their viewpoints. Uh, I feel that the, the uh, authority here, however, is with God. So Psalm chapter 18, verse 31. For who is God save the Lord? Or who is a rock save our God? All right, so the terminology is who is God save the Lord? That is Jehovah God of the Old Testament the Lord Jesus Christ of the New Testament. They are one in the same. So he's identifying that. It's very important. Chapter 33. <clears throat> and look at verse 12. Psalm 33, verse 12. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord and the people whom he hath chosen for his own inheritance. Blessed is the nation whose God is Jehovah God, which is Jesus Christ. He didn't say, blessed is the nation whose, whose God is anyone you choose. He said it specifically. All right, and Psalm 25, one more, one more here, 25. And look here in verse five, 25, five. Take it one step further. Lead me in thy truth and teach me, for thou art the God of my salvation. On thee do I wait all the day. 
So not only do we find that the God of the Old Testament is Jesus Christ of the New Testament, that that salvation is only through him. He is the God of our salvation. It's not the church. It's not an institution. It's him. It's always been him. Okay. But it, if we go back here at Chronicles, it also means that the, the restraints that are in Scripture, the encouragements of Scripture, um, it means there's an implicit faith in that God. It doesn't do anybody any good to, to look at this and say, okay, I understand what you're saying, um, but, you know, I, I don't make it personal. So I had two more window people today, different from... Adam and, and Jonathan, and you can pray for them. One is Sam and the other one is Paul. And so I was talking to Sam and asking him some pretty important questions. And he said he was raised Methodist and he kind of opened the door for me. And, and he went on and I said, I was raised Lutheran. And then I got saved and he laughed and he told, he told Paul, <laughs> the other guy, and they just thought that was really funny. Uh, I said, do you understand why I said that? And he said, I think I do. I said, I went back to that, that minister and asked him, why did you never tell me the truth of the gospel? Amen. Why? I said, you, you said that Christ died for all men. Great. But you never said that he died for me personally, that he came for me, he shed his blood for me, he died for me, he rose again for me. You know what he said? Nothing. Nothing. So this is important. We can't, we can't allow the multicultural aspect of who God is. God of the Old Testament is Jesus Christ of the New Testament. You can't, you have no wiggle room here. Godless people, scripture says, are fools. I don't say it. And there's nothing holding the wicked imaginations back from their very being. I think godlessness brought in the, the flood in Noah's day. Oh, they were eating, they were drinking, they were given in marriage, blah, blah, blah. Nothing about God, nothing whatsoever. And even though Noah preached righteousness to them in judgment, nobody responded. Nobody. Imagine 100 to 120 years of preaching and nobody responds. Oh, they responded negatively. Yeah, we don't want to hear that. So this is, this is important. It, the, the true God, the true and living God, has to be an essential toward peace and tranquility of any country. Number two, same verse, verse three. And without a teaching priest... Without a teaching priest, okay? So, in other words, true faith within being passed down to gener generations after themselves. Uh, we, don't, we don't have a, a priesthood as such. I could say the Bible says that I am part of a royal priesthood as a saved person, and so would you. But... The lady next door was out front one day, and she says, what do I call you? I said, anything you want to call me. She said, can I call you father? I said, accept that. Can I call you a priest? I said, no, nah, I wouldn't do that either, because uh, I don't think you'd understand if I said yes. Well, what do I call you? I said, you can call me Mike. And you can call me Pastor Mike. But, you know, you're not going to call me father. And you're not going to call me, you know, a priest in, in, the, in the venue of Eastern Orthodox uh, religion. Okay, number two, the teaching priest. And I think this, what this is, you have something within you if you're saved. You have the Holy Spirit within you. You have the truth of the gospel because you're saved. And that is to be passed on. So hold your place here, go to Deuteronomy chapter six. Deuteronomy chapter six. And I'm telling you, this, this is as important as the true and living God. 
If what we have isn't going to be passed on, what's going to happen? The Mormons are passing on their lies, Jehovah Witnesses their lies, Muslims their lies, Hindus their lies, Buddhists their lies, and what are we doing? We're not passing on lies, we're passing on the truth, we're supposed to. So Deuteronomy 6, and look down here in verse 6. And these words, well, let's read 4 and 5. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee, thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. There is a there is a ongoing method of teaching that is not audible. You're able to teach audibly, but most of what's say what's going on here is inaudible. You teach by the way you, the time you go to bed, the time you get up. Uh, all of these things are teaching, and they're all important. All right, so 2 Timothy chapter 2 gives us another revelation from the Apostle Paul concerning teaching. Remember, now we're talking about the teaching of the truth being essential to tranquility or peace. Second Timothy chapter 2. And look here in verse 2. Second Timothy 2 2. And the things that thou hast heard of me, Paul, among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. So Paul had the measure of truth, and he gave it out among many witnesses. So now we're down to one and two. And they, in turn, were to take the things that they heard and teach them well enough to the next, the next person or the next generation well enough so that they all got the same information. What happened when the, I, I don't know what they were revivals, but they were, they were great, great manifestations of the Holy Spirit working in the hearts and lives of American people. And we had, we had a group of people from Moody to the Sunday to Jones to Christmas Evans, um, a bunch of people that were going around and preaching the truth and people were being saved in droves. And what happened to the next generation? Well, it wasn't, wasn't as good as when these people got saved, and then the next, and the next. And now we're here, now we're here and we're trying to start all over with people that haven't heard the truth at all. Somebody dropped the ball. And so in the interim, our country declined because the truth was not going out. It had, it's essential, it has to go out. And then we can, we can skip over to verse 15 because this is incorporated in that. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So we have a fourfold instruction leading to verses three and four, being good soldiers of Jesus Christ, not being caught up in the affairs of this world. And that's like a foreign concept today. Most people know more about recreation and sports than they know about God and about the truth in scripture. And so if we're not gonna study, I think, I think it's the lack of study that promulgates great problems in our country and in, in, in any, anywhere we are. We, we need to study to be able to instruct people in the truth. So let's be honest. There are few in whatever ministry you want to you name um, 
that are teaching people Bible truths. Solid, essential Bible truths. They're teaching about the Bible. Uh, they're teaching books uh, that somebody has written and saying this is what we're teaching and we use the, the Bible to open up only as an example of what the book is saying to so what a human being wrote down. And we're equating their writings as equal to God's, and they're not. And they ha everything has to be measured by Scripture. So some of these people are, that I'm talking about are storytellers. That's all they are. Osteen. Osteen is nothing but a storyteller. Rip Van Winkle. That's a, that is, that is the, the best you can say. Um, some are motivational speakers. Very good at what they say, but they're not teaching the truth. They're not, they're not giving you the, the whole counsel of God. Some, are, some, of, some of them are nothing but a clown show. And there's others that are charlatans. They're endeavoring to separate your money for themselves and for their own benefit. And, there's the, and then there's the worst of, of compromisers who encourage falling for and defending anything that rolls down uh, potholes, uh, which are infested on the sides in the gutters with uh, stench and garbage. So I was reading here the other day, I, I told you about this, this girl in uh, a contemporary Christian music megachurch of, of sorts, who spoke against the people that were writing the music and said, you know, how bad it was. And wouldn't you know, somebody came on the scene and defended everything that's being done and bringing up certain situations against different songs we sing that have people that ultimately, you know, weren't the best in the world, but you know, these are so old, why would you bring up things that are 200 years old and say, well, you know, you sing that song and, and what's the big deal? Uh, so to me, these are the worst of compromisers. And we have antichrists and false messiahs. Do you know how many false messiahs Israel has fallen for? They number in the hundreds. People have come along and they say, well, I'm the messiah and they fall for him. Sometimes it's locally, sometimes a little more nationally. But listen, we have to be instructed in the truth, and the truth has to go out from us. It can't stay in. You'll blow up. You, you'll, you'll explode. And ultimately, people are going to say, why didn't you tell me that? Well, I read a book, and it talked about uh, you, you couldn't tell people that initially because you didn't want to confront them. And so you tried to win them by your behavior and your actions. And then you were going to slip the gospel is. And tell me that the gospel is not confrontational. How do you make it non-confrontational? Well, you take sin out. You take hell out. You even take the resurrection out. And what do you have left? Nothing. So you have the true God, the truth is being instructed in the word, being given out, and then number three, and, say, and here in the same verse, verse three, I've got to get out, I'm, on, I'm in another book, forget, forgive me. Second Chronicles chapter 15, we have the true God, we have the teaching priests, and now, and without law, without law. All right, the law is part of the word of God. And so we would, we would in the application, we would say the entire word of God. Uh, we don't worship nature. We don't worship our ancestors. Uh, idol, we don't worship idols, which dominates uh, a lot of religions and a lot of our our country. It's not false religion of any, any stripe. It is, but only the truth revealed by God of absolute truth, written down for us, 
and protect it from change and destruction from above. If I know that God has said something to me, and it can be positive and it can be negative, a lot of promises are negative, we don't like those. But they are as true and absolute as the positive ones. Believe on, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That's an absolute truth. So is if you don't believe on Christ, you're gonna die and go to hell. And it's just, they're both as true. And God has protected that for us from any change. So then when you come down here to verse five, and in those times was no peace to him that went in, out, nor to him that came in, but great vexations were upon the inhabitants of the countries. And nation was destroyed by na of nation and city of city, for God did vex them with all adversity. So during that interim there, that, that uh, as Arias spoke about it to the king, there was no peace to the people, but rather vexation. All right, let me define vexation. It's, it's got a, several meanings. It means confusion. It means tumult, uproar, destruction. You've seen it in Afghanistan. You, I don't care how little or how much, you have seen it of late after the callous heartlessness of the leadership of our country who, who was elected to protect us, protect all of us, wherever we may be. I am ashamed. I am embarrassed. My heart is broken that somebody could say to the thousands of Americans in Afghanistan, you don't matter. We want the refugees. Send them. And if you happen to get out, great. How deplorable. This, but this is, this is where we are. And, and this is a vexation. And who sent it? God sending it. The shooting began as soon as, the, as soon as it was announced that they took over. The mayhem is continuing to ensue. And many Afghan people decided to die by their desperation to get out. Whatever means, knowing it had to be certain death. You, if you've seen the pictures, I never watched the, any of the, the, the travesties at 9-11. I just couldn't do it. I've seen some still pictures, and, and even them, it's hard for me to look at. Well, I've seen a plane take off with bodies flying off out of Afghanistan in the air. I've seen pictures from inside of people just hanging on by their leg. One man holding on to the back of an engine, you know he's going to be incinerated, but it didn't matter. He was not going to die in the face of those, those Taliban people. And I just heard that before I came here, one of the ones that came off the plane was a boy, a young boy. Despicable, absolutely despicable. And how similar to the trade Twin Towers, but on the opposite side. In our country, we have Antifa and Black Lives Matter. They're doing the same work as the Taliban. They are no different. Now, some of your media people contrast us to the Taliban. That's, that's really funny, isn't it? We're not terrorists, but these people are. They're doing the same work as the Taliban. They're looting, they're destroying, they're burning. They're threatening to conform everybody to Soviet-style oppression. And that's their agenda. And it's being allowed in our country. If we're sick about what's going on in Afghanistan, why aren't we sick about what's going on here? And let's not forget the, gov the media's role and the government's role, most especially this squad of radicals that despise our country. I think they would be better served if they renounced this country 
and get a citizenship in Afghanistan or Cuba or Venezuela or Russia and take Nancy with her. Really, come on, this is, this is sick. If we go down this road of no true God allowed, but we can have the false gods, we can talk about any of the false gods, but not the true God. No teaching of the word of God in our churches, in our schools, in our seminaries, or worse of all, at home. You say, well, that would never happen. Listen, if, they're, if, they, if they're going to mandate masks, and they did before, didn't they? And if they're going to mandate vaccines, which they're going to do, why would they mass mandate no Bible teaching? Well, you can have a church, but you can't say anything. You can't read anything about scripture. You can just meet, you can become a social club, like the animal clubs, the moose and the elk, and, and whatever else they do. And then number, number three, the personal, that personal liberty will remake us to a nation of rebels and criminals and outlaws. Are we there yet? No. Are we on our way? Absolutely. First Peter chapter four. Let's look here at first Peter chapter four. And begin let's begin reading here in verse eleven, first Peter four eleven. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as the, of the ability which God giveth, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom he praises, and dominion forever and ever. Amen. You know, that has to do with number two, teaching the word, the word. All right, beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. No. Peter's talking about Nero, and it came pretty quick after this writing, but the application is way beyond Nero. The application is at our doorstep. Don't think it's strange when this, when this all happens, but rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. If he be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or an evildoer, or as a busybody in other man's affairs. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time has come, the judgment must be begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. Now, I'm not saying, I don't mean this to sound like we're putting on the armor of God, but in a sense, we're putting on the armor of God once the persecution starts. If you suffer, you suffer, but you suffer with the armor of God, totally protected. There must be a return to the God of the Bible. There has to be. Oh, you can't say that. You want our country to go to hell? Keep them out. You've got, you've got to return to the God of this Bible. And you've got to return to Bible teaching. Uh, and if you're going to teach the Bible in our country in English, then you might as well say you've got to teach the Bible of the King James because the other ones all have if, ifs, if nots, contradictions, errors, take things out, add things in. 
How are you going to know one from the other? We have to depend on scholars. I wouldn't give you a penny for a scholar. I've read scholarly material. There's things in there that I've taken, but I notice on serious things, most times they don't want to take a position. This is either right or it's wrong. And we have to decide what's right and come to that place. This is, we have to make the Bible our authority, authority, not on the authority of some puny men or women. First Timothy chapter two, first Timothy chapter two. Okay, verse one. I exhort, therefore, that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. All right, let me say something. I believe our prayers, I believe our prayers here are too timid, they're too shy, and they're too wrong. When you, live in a, when you live in a corrupt nation. We should be praying for our leaders and praying that God either saves them or removes them. Oh, we live in a country that votes everybody in. Then let's pray that the people that vote would have a, would have a brain to vote these people out and say, get out. Don said it with Satan, get out. The wrong thoughts, get out of here. They've got to. We've got to get rid of these people. And I know that they say, well, you can't. They, you, no, you pray for them. Yeah, you pray they get saved. There, there is not a, a feeling of, of compassion at all for the people, our people that are in, Af in Afghanistan. I'm not saying everybody in government is like oh, that way, but even people that are nowhere near where we are, are saying, what is going on? What is happening? I, I read from Israel, and, and he's astounded at what happened. How can you do this? How can you betray your own country and those people? Warfare is usually directed by two things, a ground force and an air force. So the statement from our president was, they have a tremendous ground force, well-trained. But what happened? He pulled out all the Air Force. He pulled all of our people out that, that fly. So now they were left with only the ground. And now you become sitting ducks. Not that the Taliban have Air Force. So there's a bunch of them in a valley and they're probably in the mountains and they'll probably go for the next 40 years trying to get them out of the mountains and never get them out of the mountains. And more people will die and so forth and so on. And the, and the, and the beat goes on. Before Russia intervened, before we intervened, before we intervened in Iraq, while we're intervening in Iran, the Middle East will go on as it always went on. And they're going to be there in the end times, are we? I have no idea. It, but it's like somebody has just picked up a piece of paper and signed our death warrant. For me, I, I'm, I'm going to pray, God, get a hold of their hearts or get them out. No compromise. I'm done. I'm done thinking that this is a winnable uh, a winnable battle. And, and if anything were to, were to happen, I mean, there, there are some people, well-respected people that I, that I read from time to time, and they're saying they're not, they're not conspiracy people, but he says it's hard to come away with what's happened and not say, what is, what is happening behind the scenes? And I'm not going to go there. But there's got to be something happening. 
And I don't even want to speculate. All I know is I'm here to give out the word, to hold fast to the word, believe in, in the Lord Jesus Christ as God manifests in the flesh, give out the truth of scripture, and, and, and be a lawful, law-abiding citizen. We believe in law and order. The word, and there's order to the word. It's not random thoughts here and there. It's all ordered. It's there for a reason. It didn't just pop up there. They didn't know where to put it, so they said, well, let's see, we'll find a place here. Okay, why don't we stick it in Nehemiah, and we'll add a chapter to Nehemiah. It wouldn't fit. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be the same. With all that said, we have to keep on keeping on. And while it may bother us immensely, we, we band together, we pray, we band together, we worship, we band together, we give out the word, we live out the word, we give it to other people, and for what happens thereafter, the Lord knows. We're not going to quit, we're not going to compromise to prove, you know, to make some people happy. We're going to continue to stay on board of scripture, and hopefully so will you. So let's pray. Father, we are, we are distressed what is happening in our nation. You began as the centerpiece to this country. And there are people who despise this country that want you out. And if they get their way, you will be out, but not in our hearts, not in our lives. And so if worse comes to worst, and we suffer for that, we suffer for that. It just makes us mindful of with the expression at the end of Revelation, even so come Lord Jesus. We know we, we win in the end, and until then we're gonna stay the course. But no one can turn away and think that, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll achieve the same results. No, the results are already in, in, in action. They're, they're moving. And they're moving in an opposite direction of everything this, this country once stood for. And law and order is out the window. If we want to get a good look at what it's going to be like, let's go to Chicago. Father, every weekend, multiple killings and shootings. They're starting to pick up here in other places. Random shootings, no, no purpose in them, just kill people. Chaos, destruction. All to give a, a bunch of people power. Power that you will destroy by the Lord Jesus Christ in a very short period of time. So help us to stay the course and pray for those who, of our country who are there in Afghanistan, the righteous people of Afghanistan that uh, are going to be slaughtered. Just pray that they may find a way of escape. And uh, for our country that uh, if judgment comes, we know it's going to come on the, on the just and the unjust. And so we prepare ourselves and make ourselves ready. We ask for safety as we go to our places tonight with a renewed hope in the truth of your word. Our, can, our country can get back to peace and tranquility. But we have to turn to you, the true and living God. We have to learn from your word. And there has to be law and there has to be order. And until that time, 
I think we're going to see what Amaziah said for a long period of time. Israel was vexed. Nations were going after nations. We see that. We see it in the, in the beginning of sorrows in Matthew 24. And it's just bedlam. And so we ask you to keep a hedge of protection around us individually and collectively as a local church. And we just pray that you dismiss us with your blessing here tonight. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.